You know, I, I guess it's fitting that I would come now and talk about a village, giving that performance that we just saw. It, fi it fits very nicely. But I also find it very interesting that in our country, uh, it was Hillary Clinton that brought to light the concept of, or the proverb, the African proverb, that it takes a village to raise a child. So I'd ask you to maybe take a quick journey with me, a short journey, and maybe experience my past my past village, my present village, and possibly spend some time dreaming about what the modern day village might look like. See, my journey started at age six. When my family took a cross country trip from Portland, Oregon to Mendenhall, Mississippi. Now, we're in the deep south, it's late one night, and instead of sitting in the car saying, are we there yet? I'm sitting in the car saying, can we eat yet? Very hungry, my sisters and brothers are hungry, and we're going by restaurant after restaurant after restaurant, so many that I start to count the restaurants. Finally, we come to a restaurant and we stop, I hop out of the car and I run towards the door. My mom yells at me, Tony, stop, and she grabs me and takes me by the hand and we walk by the front door and proceed to the back door and we go into the restaurant to have dinner. So for the first time at age six, I understand that black people can't eat at every restaurant in the South, and in fact, some of the restaurants you eat at, you must go to the back door. My journey moves on to coming home and sitting at the couch and looking at TV, and what I see is demonstrations and protests, and I'm seeing dogs biting at the legs of men, women, and children, and I'm seeing fire hoses spraying water at individuals, and I'm seeing men, women, and children being beaten with billy clubs, and I'm looking at all of that, and all of this is leaving an imprint on how I view America. In addition to that, I see that Martin, Malcolm, and Medgar are assassinated, as well as the Kennedys. So all of this time, I'm wondering, what does this mean to me? So next on the journey, we go to a time when I was a sophomore in high school. And as a sophomore in high school, I come home for lunch one day, and I'm eating cereal, and I put my hand up on a, on a bed that was there, and I feel something, I'm just eating the cereal, and I pull it over, and it's actually a gun. I think it's a play gun. The handle is broke. And I put it up to my head while I'm eating the cereal, and eventually I turn it away, and I pull the trigger, and it's actually a real gun. The gun goes off. So I drop the gun, and I'm stunned because I'm feeling like, wow. My father would have come home and saw me in a pool of blood and would have never forgiven himself for having left a loaded gun in the house. And I'm thinking that... My friends at school would have suggested that, wow, he committed suicide. Why did he do that? But all the time, I'm thinking in my mind, wow, I'm alive. There must be a purpose for me on the planet. My journey moves forward to my sophomore year in high school, and I'm playing on an all-black basketball team in predominantly all-white Oregon, and we go to the coast to play a basketball game. And as we ride into the city, there's dummies painted black with ropes hanging around their necks, hanging from the poles, and that was our welcome to the city to play that basketball game. Later that year, we played against our arch, our, our arch rivalry, and there was a, we lost, lost the game. There was a fight after the game, and we stayed, had to stay down in the locker room for about two hours because of the violence that was happening. And as a direct result, we were almost kicked out of the league and had our games moved from after school or from evening to after school. Nothing happened to our arch rivalry. That was only brought our way. Later on that next year, we won the state basketball championship again on that all black team in all white Oregon. And actually that game was in front of the largest crowd to ever witness a game in the Memorial Coliseum. 
But winning the game wasn't what was most important. What was most important was the village that surrounded me during this time, the team village, the school village, the neighborhood village, because after we won that championship, as we walked out into the street, people would actually come out and clap for us. We were local celebrities because at that time, that's all the village could rally around. So they clothed us, they fed us, they motivated us, they inspired us to do well. And because of that village, we were able to get through that adversity and eventually win a state title. That was my village then. So now let's take a look at the village that I work, play, and live in today. In my village today, only 38% of black children live with both parents. Over 12,000 babies are born to teen parents every single day. Black children are more than twice as likely to be in foster care. In 2011, over 16 million children were considered poor. Black children are seven times more likely to be persistently poor, poorer than white children. Every three hours, a child or teen is killed by a firearm. Every eight hours, a child or teen commit suicide. And lastly, 186 children are arrested for drug offenses every day. Over 3,000 kids drop out of school every day. And black children are more than four times as likely to be expelled from school. That's my village. And guess what? That's your village too. By the year 2023, the stats suggest that minority youth in America will become the majority youth in America. So we can look at those stats and think that they perhaps are the exception, but in our future, if we don't do business differently, they may become the rule. My village is your village. Your village becomes my village. So now let's move on to yet another village, the modern-day village the village that we would aspire to be. See, in this village, we believe that all youth, all kids, all children have a gift. And it's our job as adults in the village to provide every option and every opportunity we can to make sure that every child reaches that gift. In the modern day village, it is our expectation that every child will get a quality education in their own neighborhood school. In our village, we believe that every child and every family should have health care, should have an affordable home, and should have quality food to eat and not be regulated to the so-called food desert. And lastly, in our village, we would expect that the laws of the land would protect that black boy in inner northeast Portland or outer northeast Portland the same way it would protect that white boy in Dunthorpe Lake Oswego, West Lynn, or the West Hills. You see, the modern day village is a collection of people providing support for every child and every family. Let me ask this question. Is there anyone in here that has never made a mistake? Okay. Anyone in here that's never fallen down? Okay. So I think the real question here is not whether or not we've fallen down. The question is, do you have the ability to get up? Do you have a support system around you that can help you get up? Do you have the courage to get up? And do you have the hope that if you get up, it will make a difference? In our modern day village, all of those things are there based on the people that are in it. See, what we need in America right now is a call to action, a call to action around creating this modern day village. Reminds me of a story by, I read on uh, Craig Kilberger, I think his name is, he, one of the co-founders of Me To We. And I'm gonna shorten this story, uh, it's, a, it's a great story, but it's a story around calling to action. He talks about taking some volunteers to Ecuador to build a school in the hills in Ecuador, and he only has two weeks to do it. They get there, the road is very narrow, uh, it's harvest time, and they just cannot get their supplies up the hill. And a week goes by, a week and a half goes by, 
And he finally decides, I need to go talk to the chief. So he goes in and talks to the chief. The chief listens to the story. She goes outside to the village and said, tomorrow there will be a Minga. She comes back in and basically dismisses them. They don't know what's up. They think that, wow, nothing is going to happen. They go back. They tell their volunteers, let's pack up. Tomorrow morning, we need to leave. Maybe we can come back another time and do this. When they wake up the next morning, they come out into the village, and there are people everywhere, hundreds of people from all around with supplies and tools ready to build. They can't believe it. So they go back to the chief and say, how does this happen? She says, yesterday, I called for Aminga. Aminga is a call to action a community coming together for the good of all. Now imagine in America if we could call for a Minga, if we could call for a Minga around education, if we could call for a Minga around health care, if we could call for a Minga around the criminal justice system. But we know in America when we call for a Minga, it's because of 9-11, Hurricane Sandy, or Sandy Hook. It's always in the face of adversity. Rarely do we get out in front of it. So in the modern day village, I think it's really about equity. It's about equity in our village. It is about maybe diversity being a part of the foundation of our village. It is about each and every one of us taking our time, our talents, and our treasures and using them to impact the equity in our village. Because it's really about people taking care of people to me, it reminds me of the song by the stylistics back in the 60s. I'm dating myself. The one that talks about people make the world go round. And that is absolutely true. You will know that you're in the modern day village when you can do this. When you are walking down the street and you see a black boy or man in a hoodie with his hands in his pocket walking towards you and you don't clench your purse, your heart does not start racing and you don't see the need to cross the street you will know that you see them the way that you see others and that you have just arrived into the modern day village. Let me finish on a story. For my mother's 84th birthday, I asked her, Mom, what do you want for your birthday? With a straight face, with no hesitation, she said, I want to meet the president, the president. I said, Mom, you want to do what? She said, I want to meet the President of the United States. I said, Mom, we're in Portland. In Portland, I got a little bit of clout and a little bit of influence. If he came here, I think I could probably get that done. But Mom, you talking about the President? She said, boy, I want to meet the President. <laughs> okay? So, I get on the phone, start making some phone calls. I have a very close friend in Miami by the name of Alonzo Mourning, who was an NBA player, now works for the Miami Heat, but is also a major fundraiser for the Democratic Party. So I called up Zoe is what I called him. I called up Zoe and said, hey, Zoe, man, my mom said she wanted to meet the president. <laughs> he said, Tony, if you can get her to Miami, we can make that happen. So I load up my mom, put her on the plane. We fly cross country to see the president of the United States. So we get there, we go through, and if you've been to these events before, you understand that there's door number one and door number two. You go through door number one, it costs you $1,000, you end up in a room, the president comes out, he says a few words, he's out. <clears throat> door number two, you come in, you get in a line, you get, a, you get the opportunity to shake his hand, take a picture, and in my mom's case, kiss him on the cheek. <laughs> Try to tell her mom you weren't supposed to do that. <laughs> But that's only part of the story. The real part of the story for me was the symbolism of my mom, who was 84, with a walker, going through security. And then each step that she took, and let me just back up and say, this happened in the Fontainebleau. For those of you not familiar with the Fontainebleau in South Beach, this is a huge hotel. It must have been a quarter of a mile from security to the room that we went in. And each step she took just brought back my thoughts around, this is a black woman born and raised in Minden Hall, Mississippi, deep south, segregated south, racist, 
prejudice south, now taking a step, with each step bringing her further away from the past and closer to being able to shake the hand and kiss the cheek of the first African-American president in the United States of America. What a moment. But for me as well, it said a lot because it brought me from not being able to walk into a restaurant. It brought me through looking at all of the water hoses, the batons, the dogs, the rope around the neck. Brought me through all of that, through a championship, to me as well, alongside of my mother, seeing from her generation to my generation the growth that have occurred. So for me, at the end of the day, when I think about you know, forward motion becoming individual motion that becomes collective motion to creating the modern day village, I don't know that there's a better example of a modern day village when we look at what has occurred in this nation with having an African American president. But whether you like his politics or any of that is not the point. The point is simply this. We, as a people, are interdependent upon each other. And irregardless of what happens to us on a daily basis, at the end of the day, we are simply one humanity. We are one collective group. And at the end of the day, what I feel is that we used to, on our basketball team, have this saying, and this saying took us all the way to the championship, and I think it is the exact same thing that will take America where it needs to go. The saying was just simply, we are one. If all of us can remember in each and every day in our collective, collectivism, in our modern day village, that we are just simply one people. Thank you.